All right, good evening. A few adjustments here real quick. There we go. So it's been a while. It's been a few months, actually. So I'm um, happy to get back into our lectures on the early church fathers, looking at the uh, essence and attributes of God. And we'll, tonight I'm going to be finishing up our last of the Cappadocian fathers, the Cappadocian trio, as I call them. So we're going to be looking at uh, St. Basil of Caesarea. So the works that we're going to be reading through tonight, well, the works I'm going to be drawing, where I've drawn my, my exposition of their theology from is uh, Against Eunomius and On the Holy Spirit. So Against Eunomius, and I'll explain more as I get into it, is uh, three books, kind of broken down uh, through key, key, you know, key distinctions we'll talk about, and then his last one is the uh, on the Holy Spirit, which is a, which is a very much needed work at this time. So I shall get started. So, so we come now to our last of the Cappadocian fathers, but not the least. He was considered the leader of the three, a bulwark in the attack against the Arians in the later fourth century. Basil of Caesarea from 329 to 379, so a, a somewhat kind of a short life, but a very powerful one, also called Basil the Great was the leading figure of the group of three Cappadocian fathers who championed Nicene Orthodoxy against the Arians in the later 4th century. He thus became the chief architect of the Cappadocian doctrine of the Trinity, which became the definitive doctrine for the East and the West. Now, Basil, he denies the, that unbegottenness is an adequate definition of the essence of God and defends the doctrine inherited from Origen and Athanasius of the eternal generation of the Son. The generation of creatures is physical and temporal. The generation of the sun is ineffable and eternal. Here Basil makes the distinctive contribution to Trinitarian doctrine. Athanasius in the older Nicenes had defended the deity of the sun by insisting that he was consubstantial with of the same essence or substance as the father. Now Basil made a distinction between usia and hypostasis which confusingly may also be literally translated as substance, and thus used interchangeably. He spoke of the one usia of God, but three hypostases, the hypostasis of the Father, the hypostasis of the Son, and the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately this became the definitive doctrine of the Trinity in the East. So I mentioned the two key works are going to be against Eunomius, which is a a refutation of the apology of Eunomius, who was an Arian extremist, and his other work is On the Holy Spirit, which is one of the first treatises on the Holy Spirit from the Church Fathers uh, that we have seen today. So, the heresy of Arius not only lowered the dignity of the Son, he lowered the Spirit as well, and during the Arian controversy, the attention centered mostly on the Son. In fact, the Arian creeds did not directly attack the divinity of the Spirit. However, they did not affirm his unity was with the Father, or with the Father, excuse me. The doctrinal status of the Spirit remained in the foreground, and this created more confusion as the debate continued. The doctrinal unity on the Trinity regarding the divine persons needed to be ironed out, and a gentleman by the name of Amphilochius, he was cousin to Gregory of Nazianzus and a friend of Basil, he visited him in 374 and he urged him to produce a work that would hammer this out once and for all. And so he did. And he removed all doubt as to the nature and person of the Spirit, fully divine God of God, and one with the Father and the Son. So Basil's Against Eunomius is divided up into three parts or three books. The center of the debate is not on whether we are to use the names like Father and Son and Spirit, or whether to apply the term God to Father and Son, but rather it is how to divide up or to switch metaphors, how to map the territory. It is about what is meant when God is said to be the unbegotten or Father or good, not whether one should say these things in the first place. The main themes of Basil's response are, one, the role of conceptualization in theology, two, the, distinct, dis I'm sorry, the distinction between positive and negative theological terms, three, the distinction between names said in common of the Father and the Son in names specifically of each, and four, the distinction between what is true of God in say and from eternity and what God has done on behalf of humans, 
where whose perspective is inherently temporally structured. And I pulled that part from the introduction uh, of Against Eunomius. So book, book one. <clears throat> Basil begins by engaging in argumentation about, I'm sorry, in argumentation about the nature of human speech about God, termed in the Greek epinoia, which we would call conceptualization. More defined, it is the activity of reflecting on and identifying the distinct qualities or properties of something. Now, Eunomius asserts that we cannot know God by this, by this way, this conceptualization or epinoia is in the Greek. Basil responds in detail, explaining this process that we actually do this all the time. His point is to demonstrate how Scripture accommodates divine, I'm sorry, dis, uh, Scripture accommodates the divine to human capacities. Basil gives the example of grain. One looks at a simple grain seed and sees one little piece of grain. However, when examining it in detail, one can see, can conceive or conceptualize different designations to indicate the different things that we have conceived. The grain at one time is called fruit, another seed, and another time nourishment. These categories are assigned based on the different times or stages of the grain's life, planting, harvesting, then consuming. Basil notes that such concepts do not dissolve after utterance, which is a, a phrase you name you know misuse. Rather, Quote, the concepts remain settled in the soul of the one who has conceived them, end quote. To sum it all up, Basil writes, Generally speaking, all things recognized through sense perception, in which seem simple and substrate, which is the, the substance of the thing, but which admit of a complex account upon further consideration, are said to be considering through the conceptualization, end quote. So now Basil is going to move into this practice, theologically speaking. So in Scripture, Christ gave himself many names, such as the door, the way, the bread of life, the vine, the shepherd, and the light. Now, while Christ is one, simple, not composite, he references himself by many other things, which differ from each other as well. And he does so based on his, quote, sorry, based on, quote, his different activities and his relation to the objects of his divine benefaction or gift, end quote. Now, I'm sorry, I'm going to be saying things, and I'll probably forget to say quotes at times, but uh, I will try to make sure I do that for you guys. So to note a few, Basil writes that Christ calls himself, quote, the light of the world, because he illumines those who have purified the eye of their soul with the splendor of his knowledge, end quote. And the vine, because he nurtures those who have been planted in him by faith, so that they bear the fruits of good works, end quote. So in doing epinoia, we can conceive of God's redemptive work through the association of, of real things that we can sense in the world, thus enabling believers to grow deeper in their knowledge of Christ. John Baer, commenting on this passage, notes, We do not reflect on the essence itself, but on the way in which it appears to us, the manner in which it presents or reveals itself, in other words, its activity or energia. Therefore, Basil questions, why then, can we not have a conceptual framework for the unbegotten God of the universe? And the term unbegotten is the focal point of the entire debate. And Basil writes, and this is a large block quote, he says, We will discover that the same unbegotten is said in no other way. For we say that the God of the universe is incorruptible and unbegotten, designating him with these names according to various aspects. Whenever we consider ages past, we find that the life of God transcends every beginning and say that, it, that he is unbegotten. Whenever we stretch our mind forward to the ages to come, we designate the one who is without boundary, infinite, and comprehended by no terminal point as incorruptible. Therefore, just as incorruptible is the name we give him because his life is without an end, so too is unbegotten the name given because... His life is without a beginning, when we consider each through conceptualization. What reason could there be, then, for denying that each of these names is conceptualized and that they, can, they constitute a confession of what truly belongs to God? End quote. So Eunomius claims that human conceptualization of God dishonors him. Calling him unbegotten is to confess that he is what he is, which Eunomius says God's substance is unbegotten, right? That's the big mistake here, and I'll keep reading. 
And so the issue in Enomius' claim is that in asserting God's substance is unbegotten, the relational term of origin given to the Son, begotten, then situates the Son less than the Father, because Eunomius erroneously, univocally states, unbegotten equals divine essence. So he's, he's making that term, he's determining the term, unbegotten equals the divine essence. So if the Son is begotten, he cannot have the unbegotten or divine essence. Now Basil unfolds the implications from, from, you know, from Eunomius' reasoning, stating that if one is to avoid making conceptual relations about God because they profane his holiness, that all things that we attribute to God are then references to his substance. However, would it not be absurd to refer to God's creative power, providence, and foreknowledge as his substance? The point is such designations all landing on the same meaning provide us with no means of making distinctions about God as Scripture teaches. He cites Psalm 103.24, we see his creativity. Uh, Psalm 144.6, his encompassing providence. Uh, 17.2, his invisible nature. Malachi 3.6, his divine substance is unchanging. Furthermore, Basil contends, or Basil, I go back and forth, sorry. Basil contends that if we have followed Eunomius' logic, then, we, then he actually refutes himself because Scripture makes the same designations about the Son. Therefore, according to Eunomius, such terms would be indicative of the Son's substance. But he doesn't apply this method in references to the Son, which reveals Eunomius' reasoning is arbitrary. Utilizing epinoia allows us to mediate, I'm sorry, meditate on the fullness of God's splendor, speaking of his attributes about what God is like, while avoiding stating what God is. Furthermore, in epinoia, we deploy the use of apophatic theology, which gives us a framework of ascription that keeps us from, quote, falling into inappropriate notions in our suppositions about God, end quote. When we say that God is incorruptible, we are saying that God is not subject to corruptions. Invisible, we are saying that God is not observed through our eyes. Immortal, immortal God cannot die. So unlike Eunomius' claim that Epinoia is blasphemous, Basil demonstrates that it is honoring of the divine essence because it safeguards us from idolatry, in that it, quote, forbids us from lowering our thoughts to the level of what is not appropriate, end quote. Basil reiterates Eunomius' error of, quote, situating unbegottenness in the substance itself, end quote. That's important, right? That's, that's Eunomius' error. He's saying unbegottenness is the substance of God itself. With that said, Basil affirms one side of the, equation, of the equation, quote, the substance of God is unbegotten, end quote, just not the inverse. Furthermore, Basil finds it important to remind Eunomius that, quote, Partlessness and simplicity are the same thing as far as the notion is concerned. For that which is not composed of parts is partless. Similarly, that which is not constituted from many elements is simple. Now, Basil issues this rudimentary lesson because it appears that Eunomius has forgotten simplicity and its entailment. To show the absurdity of Eunomius' thinking, Basil engages in a discussion about our lack of rational knowledge about the earth, its parts, its form, along with human sensations, and that through sense perception we can comprehend the elements all around us. But in no way, in no way are we able to comprehend them rationally speaking. While we can distinguish between hard and soft, heat and cold, and such other things, we would not attribute softness as its substance. Therefore, it is of the, quote, utmost insanity to think we can comprehend the divine essence attributing unbegottenness to its substance. But Basil returns to Scripture to demonstrate the mode of knowledge we attain about God and the way we attain it. He writes, quote, It is to be expected that the very substance of God is incomprehensible to everyone except the only begotten and the Holy Spirit. But we are led up from the activities of God and gain knowledge of the Maker through what He has made. And so come in this way to an understanding of His goodness and His wisdom. 
For what can be known about God is that which God has manifested, right, Romans 1.19, to all human beings. The emphasis on the activities of God in which the world was made points us to the, quote, way of causality, in that whatever effect is observed, the cause the cause has relation to it. That's a common thing, right? The cause and effect are related to each other, and we work our way up to cause by the effect. And the effects that we see, which demonstrate goodness and beauty, brings us to the conclusion that God is good and beautiful. In Scripture, this God expresses himself in figurative language so that we can associate what we comprehend with what we cannot comprehend, which is the divine essence, right? It becomes this backdrop, right, for us to understand God through the things he has made. And Basil notes that Eunomius is heir of directly applying anthropomorphic language and scripture to God literally is what the atheists do. And this is clearly not what the scripture intends for us to do. If we do, Basil writes, then we would have to conclude that God has loins of amber, as we see in Ezekiel 8.2. He is a consuming fire, Deuteronomy 4.24. And has hair like the whitest wool, Daniel 7, 9. So moving forward from such, quote, idle curiosity, end quote, Basil draws our attention to Hebrews eleven six, 6, in which the inspired writer says, one must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now Basil's point in referencing this passage is in line with what I said earlier. The divine essence is incomprehensible and ineffable to human nature. And we must therefore examine unbegottenness itself. In doing so, quote, we find that our notion of unbegottenness does not fall under the examination of what it is, but rather, and here I am forced to speak this way, under the examination of what it is like. Right? We can't know what it is, but what it is like. End quote. Well, the quote ended a while ago. Anyways, thus we consistently apply the distinction between positive in negative terms in our God talk. Therefore, unbegottenness, quote, does not signify his what, but that he is from no source. And then he refers to Luke's genealogical account in 323 to 38. This account, this is back to Basil again, demonstrates God's unbegottenness, and that he starts according to the flesh, working backwards, tracing the lineage back to Adam, Stopping there. And then Basil says, quote, Isn't it obvious in each of our minds that God came from no one? Here, Basil sounds the death knell. He writes, quote, Clearly, that which is from no one is without origin, and that which is without origin is unbegotten. Therefore, just as being from someone is not the substance when we are talking about human beings, so too when we are talking about the God of the universe it is not possible to say that unbegotten, which is equivalent to saying from no one, is the substance, end quote. So, having refuted Eunomius' point, Basil moves on to address, quote, a most harmful thing of all for his blasphemy against the only begotten. And obviously, Basil pulls no punches. Eunomius says that God as unbegotten could never admit a begetting that gives a proper share of his nature to the unbegotten. His intention, writes Basil, is to show that the Son is unlike the Father without using their names. Subtle villainy, he calls it. Quote, shameless and wicked blasphemy. End quote. You see, Eunomius' angle is to demonstrate that because God is unbegotten, he cannot give a share of his nature to a begotten. Then there cannot be a true comparison between the two. The point is to divide the Father from the Son, since Eunomius does not believe that the Son shares the same essence as God. But Basil retorts that such claims go against Scripture, which shows a proper comparison between the Son and the Father. Furthermore, to say otherwise, Basil writes, is to say that, quote, the apostles are liars and the gospels are liars, end quote. He continues, quote, if he has no comparison whatsoever with the Father, how could Jesus say to Philip, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you do not see me? This is in John 14, 9. How could he say, The one who sees me sees the one who sent me? That's from John 12, 45. End quote. Basil's point is that the Son, as the image of God, 
has the impression of the Father's stamps on him. That which is unknown to us, the Father, has made himself known to us in the Son. Therefore, the image of the invisible God must be like that image. And such is this likeness in Christ from the Father, that Jesus, also in 14.9, who says, The one who has seen me has seen the Father. It's, it's quite profound, right? So, he says, that which is unknown to us, who the Father is, right? Has made himself known to us in the Son. Therefore, the image of the invisible God must be like that image. Now, Basil offers a few other proof texts, Colossians 1.15 and Philippians 2.6, noting Paul's words about Christ having the form of God, reveals without a doubt, quote, the distinctive feature of the divine substance, end quote. Now, Eunomius' antics lead him to sever the comparison between the begotten and the unbegotten actually cuts us off from attaining, quote, upward knowledge that occurs through the Son, end quote. Basil's remark is crucial to observe in Eunomius' flawed theology. If the Son has no comparison to the Father, then statements of Christ having the radiance of the Father, the character of a subsistence, are meaningless. Now, Basil brings Book 1 to a close with a response to Eunomius' misunderstanding of a greater-than-I language that the Son uses in, the, in John's Gospel. He, his mistake is a categorical one. For him, likeness is a question of form and equality, a question of mass, which is proper to that which has composition. Right? So that Metaphysics, as far as what Eunomius is concerned about, when he talks about likeness, when he talks about greatness, right, has to do with mass, what is proper to us creatures. Again, that's his mistake, right? You see, the Father is simple, and so is the Son, as Basil notes. So things that have composition, having shape and figure, quote, likeness is considered to be a question of identity of form, end quote. But for that, that which does not have form, God, but his nature, quote, the likeness is the substance itself. And therefore, Basil writes, quote, in this equal, in, I'm sorry, in this case, equality is not a question of comparing masses, but rather identity of power as displayed in divine actions and activity. Christ is the power of God, Colossians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1.24, end quote. So in Christ, all the Father's power is contained which we see in John 5, 19. And Jesus saying that whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. And this error is exactly what Jesus chides the Jews for, and that he calls them to judge his claims of divinity not by his words, right, but by his actions, and which are acts of power only God can do. But for Eunomius, Father signifies activity and not substance. So when the Son says the Father is greater than I, this, quote, activity is greater than the product, end quote. The comparison then does not hold through because other passages speak of the Son as the power of God. The Son and the Father are one, John 10, 30, which refers to equality and identity and power. Therefore, greater than I language, Basil writes, quote, is according to the account of cause, end quote in that the Son's principle comes from the Father. It's a speaking generation. So in this sense, the Father is greater as cause and principle. And this is, this is part and parcel to an Eastern view of the Trinity, right? The Father is the cause, right, and principle, and the Son comes from the Father, his generation doesn't diminish the divinity of the two, it establishes a monarchical form of the Trinitarian formula, which we'll talk about a little later. And I've already covered that in previous videos. So, and while the distinction is a relation of origin, the Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, because, the equality in identity, because of the equality in identity and power, the Father's substance is not greater than the Son's substance because they share the same essence. And we have to conclude as much because God declares that he is one God. So here we see Basil's consistency pays off in that he doesn't confuse categories in his theological language as observed in Eunomius. Okay.
book two. The title of book two is On the Sun. He opens his work in response to Eunomius' blasphemies against the sun, whereby he refers to him as something begotten, genema, which is the Greek word or offspring, and something made, poema, which is a pro which product or work, to make something to do. Now, Basil states, such a claim has never been made about the sun. He cites various passages that speak about the things that are made in creation, Genesis 1, 1, Psalm 142, 5, and Romans 1, 20. While there are passages that use metaphorical references of, or figurative language employing terms pertaining to things that are made, rock, river, door, etc., about Christ, nowhere in Scripture do we see any writer referring to Christ as something made. That's important because the the discussion has to is you know circles circles around Christ being a created being, but nowhere do we ever see anything about that towards Christ. That's an important piece which I think is overlooked quite a bit. So, in the following section, again we're in book two. In the following section, we now see Basil unpack the Theologia and the Economia, right, where he engages in discussion on Christ eternal divine being apart from his works, right? So that'd be the Theologia, Christ and himself, and the outer works, Economia. Economia, or economy, however you want to say it. So Economia, in reference to the unfolding of the redemptive drama, that's another usage of it as well, is where we see the outworking of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Basil must move in this direction because Eunomius is trying to edge his argument based on the Incarnation, the beginning of the Son in time and space, arguing that the apostles were communicating about his substance in his human manifestation. So Philippians 2.7, 2 Corinthians 13.4, and Acts 2.36. Basil returns, stating, quote, He who said God made him Lord and Christ is speaking of his rule and power over all, which the Father entrusted to him. He is not describing his arrival at being. End quote. So you know me as mistake, Eunomius' mistake was to transfer the expression he created to the original beginning of the only begotten. Lord does not denote his substance, but the economy of Christ as Lord, possessing power and rule over all creation. Uh, the brilliant, uh, the late brilliant John Webster would refer to this as his enactment, right? So it's not about him coming into existence. This is the enactment of what has already been declared about the sun in time and space. Again, that goes back to the to the error of blurring or conflating economy and theolo theology or theologia and economy together. Right? These things are already uh, are already stated about Christ. The declaration of Scripture, the manifestation of Christ uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, is the enactment to show the relations to show that he already has this power. Now it's being revealed to us in time and space. Uh, Basil outlines the absurdity of Eunomius' methodology in assuming names mean substance, and it also means different substance. Peter and John have different names, but both share the same sub substance. It is, quote, their distinguishing marks considered in connection with each one of us that we are different from each other, end quote. Names do not imply substance. Rather, the name determines the character of an individual. And Basil goes on to speak about biblical figures, such as Paul and all the distinguishing marks we associate with them, encompassed in the name Paul. Here, Basil, in a warm tone, says, quote, There is no one so stupid and so inattentive to the common nature that he would be led to say this, names equals substance, end quote. For example, if we followed Eunomius' univocal designation method, then, Basil notes, when scripture refers to human beings as gods, then we would be led to say that they have the same substance as the god of the universe. Quote, that is sheer madness, end quote. And Eunomius's quote, logic here is equally crazy, end quote. Therefore, in line with the economy, the names Father and Son do not communicate the divine essence, but rather they, quote, are revelatory of the distinguishing marks of the divine persons. 
I hope you can see the, the clean logic here. And that's that's where even modern day Arians, as we call them, or even just relational relational theologians get caught up in this too, is is blurring the lines between the theologia and economia. We have to understand here, right? So these things are already distinguishing marks. The names given to them that we understand is the revelation of those marks of the divine persons. So Basil's onslaught is intense. Key passages, John 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1.3, 1, serve at the front of his attacks. A plain reading of these passages becomes a stumbling block for Basil's opponents. And this stems from the metaphysical foundation that supports the dogmatic claims derived from the text. Basil takes them for granted because they have been deployed to develop a consistent theology, metaphysically and economically speaking, so theologically and hermeneutically, as we would also say. The theological grammar provides a consistent manner of exegesis that when used in refutations is quite dumbfounding because the errors being refuted are addressed through what is a very basic and logical approach, leaving us, reading 1700 years later, scratching our heads that one could arrive at such absurd conclusions. In Eunomius chapter 2, section 15, for example, Basil asked the question, rather rhetorically to Eunomius, quote, was God the word with God in the beginning, or did, the, did he supervene later? Well, in John's account, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. For Basil, this seems basic. He writes, quote, the Son's existence from eternity, his begetting without passion, his con connaturality with the Father, the majesty of his nature, all these points he, speaking of the Apostle John, covers in a few words. So by including was, he guides us back to the beginning, end quote. Basil references other passages, John 1, 4, and, and verse 9, that demonstrate the eternity of the Son. Eunomius rejects the Spirit's testimony about the only begotten, who was with God and is God. He was begotten, Eunomius will say, but it was not in the beginning, according to a sensible reading of the Apostle John's words, as they would have it. Basil is very passionate about giving the proper glory due to the Son. He refers to the importance of avoiding, quote, corporeal comparisons and, quote, material imaginations that we are to take our cue from the Spirit authored Scripture, who has transmitted to us in the Holy Word, quote, a begetting that is worthy of God, one without passion, partition, division, and temporality, being led to the divine begetting in a way consistent with the radiance that shines from the light. End quote. It's a beautiful, beautiful text. And Basil directs us to the light of Revelation in Colossians 1.15, that of the Son as the invisible image of God, quote, co-existent with and subsides with the one who, with the one, sorry, with the, oh, sorry, it's a typo on my thing. Co-existent with and subsides with the one who brought him into subsistence. Now, again, that's not into existence, right? They coexist, but we recognize that the Son is from the Father, eternally speaking. The harmony of the scriptural texts, texts, Basil notes, do not, however, perfectly bring together the temporal and eternal realities. Rather, we are to take them as the Spirit has given them to us, even if we cannot apprehend the begetting in our minds in a manner that, quote, does not involve passion, right, or change. Basil supplies other classic texts that support the unity of being and the sameness of the divine essence the Son has with the Father, in that he is the power, wisdom, and righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and verse 30 are these key passages. Um, let me rephrase that. Uh, I'm going to say that sentence again. So, so you know, he supplies these texts, supporting the unity of being and the sameness of the divine essence the Son has with the Father, in that he's the power, wisdom, and righteousness of God, though not as a possession of God, but rather as the essence of of the one simple being of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God, revealing, quote, the Father in his entirety, as he is the radiance of his glory in its entirety, end quote. It is absurd to think, Basil writes, that the glory of God is without his radiance. 
and that at some point the wisdom of God was not with God? End quote. The logic is pretty sound, isn't it? So then, to answer the ineffable, the ineffable, no, but providing the proper logical location of the sun's point of origin, Basil asks, quote, when was he brought into being by the Father? From whatever point the Father exists. Let's make the conclusion. The Father is from eternity. The Son is from eternity, quote, connected in a begotten way to the unbegottenness of the Father, end quote. Eunomius denies these notions because to him, the Father as eternal is the same as, quote, without beginning. Thus he is unbegotten, having no cause of his own being. But because the Son is said to be begotten, right, there's that phrase, begotten, thus he has a cause to his being and is not eternal. Eunomius' blasphemous views noted here caused Basil to go off the rails. Quote, we do not construe the only begotten as having a substance in common with those which have come to be from nothing. Right? He's speaking of creatio ex nihilo. He's speaking of us creatures come to be from nothing. For that which is nothing is surely not a substance. Rather, we allot him as much superiority as the maker necessarily has over the things he himself has made. End quote. A few pages later, Basil offers a quick but insightful logic of how God commanded creation to be, referring to Psalm 148.5, with the intention of demonstrating to Eunomius that the word is not some, quote, lifeless instrument. He writes, quote, How do we say that all things come into being from the Son? In this way, the divine will, taking its origin from the primal cause as from a kind of spring, proceeds to activity through his own image, God the Word, end quote. This contrasts with Eunomius, who thinks of the Son as some kind of minister, administering the things that have been assigned to him as like some type of soldier or something. Basil catches Eunomius in reasonless sophistry. Excuse me. He mentioned the distinction between the Son and the Father, begotten and unbegotten, stating that that one differs from the other as the light from the light, the life from the life, and power from the power. And that was a quote from Eunomius. But here, Basil's reaction, quote, Behold and grasp the horrible blasphemy, end quote. How can one differentiate the concept of light from light? It makes no sense. When you look at the light, can you distinguish between the lights that come from the light? Can you distinguish from two lights, from fire from fire, if they're together? You, you can't, right? It actually makes no sense. These comparisons cannot be measured. And Basil, seeing the inconsistency, unravels Eunomius' entire position. The Son is the true light, John 1, 9. If the Father is the true light, then how can one be a lesser true light? Is the Son a dimmer light than the Father? Christ is a life, John 14, 6. The Father is a life as well, right? Can there be a lesser life? As noted, it makes no sense with if it makes no sense and with ease, Basil pulls apart his argument. Now he tones it down a little bit, moving into a precise articulation, identifying the error, and supplying a clear designation of the divine essence and economy, showing there is no contrariety in the divine substance. And I'm going to quote Basil here at length. It's a long section. Get my jaws ready here. If anyone wants to accept that which is true, namely, that begotten and unbegotten are distinctive features that enable identification and are observed in the substance, which lead to the clear and unconfused notion of the Father and the Son, then he will escape the danger of impiety and preserve logical coherence in his reasoning. The distinctive features, which are like certain characters and forms observed in the substance, differentiate what is common by means of the distinguishing characters and do not sunder the, the substance's sameness in nature. For example, the divinity is common, is common, whereas fatherhood and sonship are distinguishing marks. From the combination of both, that is, of the common and the unique, we arrive at comprehension of the truth. Consequently, upon hearing unbegotten light, we think of the Father, whereas upon hearing begotten light, we receive the notion of the Son. Insofar as they are light and light, no contrariety exists between them, whereas insofar as they are begotten and unbegotten, 
one observes the opposition between them. So opposition just means relation, right? So the whole point here is these names give us distinctions to the features of the Godhead. The, the sameness is there, but these allow us through revelation, through the Spirit, to see that they're distinct modes in the divine being of God, Father, Son, Spirit. They are obviously it's ineffable for ineffable for us to understand it, but God has given us these terms, right? Then we're actually now formulating a way of speaking about it, unbegottenness and begottenness to say there is a distinction, but they are the same in their essence. Of central importance in the discussion, or rather refutation, is the necessity of maintaining proper categories. You know me says fatal mistake, the concepts of nature and person, theologia and economia. When one confuses these categories, one runs into all sorts of hazards, notably a composite view of God. Now I underline this. Allowing language of economy, the engagement of the divine and the temporal creaturely world to function as a suitable and guiding grammar for the divine essence, blasphemy ensues. Those who reject the doctrine of divine simplicity do so not realizing, at least I don't think they do, they lose the oneness and the threeness of God. Now, the confusion of terms in Eunomius' case, the separation of unbegotten and begotten in the divine essence, leads to a composite God. When scripture uses figurative designations such as light for the divine persons, the purpose is to express a divine reality that communicates to our minds something about the essence of God. If we see these designations about the Son and the Father and the Spirit, we must keep them united, otherwise we compromise our monotheism. Basil notes, if we are to retain the simplicity and partlessness of God, <coughs> excuse me, the names we attribute to God, quote, invisible, incorruptible, immutable, creator, judge, and all the names to reference his glory, we would have to omit them or apply all of them to his substance. If we make that move, then, Basil asserts, we demonstrate that God is composite and compounded from unlike parts because different things are signified by each of these names. And as we see, the doctrine of divine simplicity is crucial to retain the scriptural dictum of the oneness of the divine being of God. That concludes Book 2. All right. Book 3. In this final act against Eunomius, Basil demonstrates the spirit. I'm sorry. He addresses the spirit. Now, he has. A, we have a separate treatise we're going to get to. So book three is kind of a little bit shorter, but book on the spirit is going to be a separate one that we go into after book three. And also will be a separate video as well. So Eunomius sees that the spirit is from the begotten, making him third in dignity and rank, and thus third in nature. In this perspective, Eunomius claims is the sacred teaching handed down and believed by the saints. Basil begins the response in bewilderment in Eunomius' claims of Catholic fidelity on the Spirit. Basil asks from where and what writings did he learn such blasphemy? Basil offers, an, offers agreement as it pertains to the rank of each person, but nowhere in Scripture do we see that rank indicates nature. Remember, we're speaking about that which is divine essence. So all we have is nature, right? We cannot make composite renderings of God. We have nature. So while there's a rank that we recognize in the essence, right, in scripture, there's no change when it comes to the nature that we actually refer the rank to. That's the problem with Eunomius. He, he makes the rank, like ontologically speaking, that's, that's the issue. That's the distinction that um, is really messing up his theology. So he makes his argument referring to angels and that they share a single designation in nature, but there are angels that have greater responsibility as overseen and presiding over nations, whereas there are those who are designed, I'm sorry, are, there are those who are designated as personal angels to God's children, like in Matthew 18.10. Basil quotes Old Testament passages showing the angels that have greater dignity as well as legions of angels at the call of Christ if the Father so wills it, Matthew 26.33. His point is to show that there are angels who are princes and others who are servants, and quote, are all, all, and quote, all are angels in nature while they differ in dignity. There is communion in nature, end quote. And therefore, the Spirit likewise, even if he's subordinate in rank, numbered third in the baptismal confession of salvation, nor in Scripture do we see that the Spirit is a third or foreign nature. 
To further support his argument, Basil defers to the dividing line, the, quote, two realities, divinity and creation, sovereignty and servitude, sanctifying power and sanctifying power, of which the former reality belongs to one by virtue of its nature, the latter by virtue of free will. And then he poses this question, which reality belongs to the spirit? The scripture testifies that the spirit by nature belongs to the first reality. You see this in John 14, 17, 15, 26, and 16, 13. Holiness by nature, quote, is observed in three subsistences. John 4, 24, Lamentations 4, 20, and 2 Corinthians 3, 17. While the name is given or in reference to the spirit reveals divine nature, Basil goes on to discuss his activities. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, Psalm 32, 6. He perfects creatures, Job 33, 4. The power of the Spirit, quote, pervades the universe, Psalm 138, 7. The Spirit is the seal of adoption for believers, Romans 8, 15. He is the true teacher, just like the Lord, John 14, 26, Matthew 23, 9 through 10. Distributes gifts to whom he wills, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Knows the mind of God and therefore can rightly judge the secrets of man, Acts 21, 11. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 12, and lavishes eternal life on us through and in Christ. 1 Timothy 6, 3, 8, 11. Uh, there's no 8, 11 in 1 Timothy, so i got to fix that one. Anyways, in light of the scriptural testimony to the nature and activity of the Spirit, he does not have a third nature, but has the one and only divine nature shared by and in the Father and the Son. Eunomius insists that the spirit was created by the God. Really bad, right, really bad. Quote, bereft of divinity and creative power, end quote. Basil takes note of the spirit's indwelling in us, the body of Christ, which scripture says that the spirit of God dwells in the body. Therefore, to deny that his share, that he shares in divinity is impious. And then Basil makes a comparison to the spirit's divine quality and the creature's divine quality, which touches on the doctrine of deification. Basil writes, quote, Moreover, if it is impious to say of the spirit, as one can say of human beings, that the divinity honored in him comes by participation and does not... I'm sorry, I'm going to say this whole section again. Basil writes, quote, Moreover, it is impious to say of the spirit, as one can say of human beings, that the divinity honored in him comes by participation and does not coexist with him by nature. For the one div divinized by grace, which would be us, right, possesses a nature subject to change and falls away from the better state whenever he is careless, end quote. So the baptismal formula of saving faith is a creature's, quote, ascent to divinity, end quote. So while there is a ranking in the formula, nevertheless, it is in this formula that one is saved and made holy. But Eunomius cannot comprehend that the spirit is beyond creation. He utters blasphemous assertions. And Basil appeals to our finitude and inability to know the spiritual things. However, in our ignorance and lack of epistemic breadth of all reality, even the things we can see, we have been taught through divine revelation that the spirit is one with the Father and the Son, in which we confess as the blessed Trinity, thus also preserving the singleness of the Trinity. Basil's last book about the Spirit is short, but he has another treatise on the Spirit, which is much more theologically rigorous and detailed in its exegesis, and is one of the first works to focus, it, focus expressively on, this, on the Spirit. And I will save that for my next video. But this was, again, this was uh, Basil's response to Eunomius. I recommend reading it. Obviously, I gave you almost 11 pages single-spaced uh, of all the exposition I could find on it that I went through, but there's much more in there to go through, and I hope this was helpful. And so our next video will be more specifically on the spirit, and it's a, it's a fantastic book. I look forward to presenting it to you guys. So hope that was good for you. All the best. Till next time.